Amen. All right. Well, it seems like it, and it has been a while. For me, I think the last day of unleavened bread may have been the last time that I had um, anything to say. <laughs> so it's good to be here. Um, I'm going to try to put some thoughts in, in order, um, things that have been ruminating in my mind. And, I, and part of that is, is when you, you think about this book, this word, and there's, there's the Old Covenant, right, or Testament, as we like to call it sometimes, the Old Testament, or the Old Covenant and the New. And I say that because I think as a group and as a, as a um, band of believers, or whatever you want to refer to us as, we claim, we claim that as one of the, the planks of our platform, I guess, or, or, or one of the differences with what we typically call mainstream because we do um, honor or, or pay more attention to the re relevance of the former covenant. Uh, not that other people don't. It's just that um, we do believe that it is Jesus Christ, obviously, is the God of the Old Testament, and that there is lots of instruction for living and so forth and so on. So we do we do claim it as one of the differences with what we refer to as mainstream, the relevance of the, of the former covenant. And I, I, I don't have an answer for this because I'm not sure it's a question. Um, how long before how long before Christ came as a human being, as a man? How long before that um, was the decision made. When we think about the former covenant and the new covenant, how long was it before Christ came as a, as a man that that decision was made? I mean, did the, father, did the father learn and discover the human inability through those generations? Was that a learning curve or was that a, was that a discovery thing for him to um, learn about the human inability to live up to? the former covenant, the old covenant, the old testament, or was it known from the beginning? Was it known from the beginning that it would turn out that way? Um, and he just wanted us to have all of those generations documented of man's inability to, to live up to, because we know a covenant is only as good as, as the two parties, right? I mean, if, if, no matter what kind of covenant you have, no matter what kind of promise you have, it's just like a marriage. If a marriage, one person can't keep a marriage together. So a covenant is only as good as both parties' ability to live up to their side of the bargain, right? So, yeah, did, did he know from the beginning? Was it a learning curve? And he figured out after enough generations that, hey, this isn't working, we have to have a plan B, or was it known, again, from the beginning that... Um, there was going to need to be another way. We just needed all this information in the Old Testament to help us understand our inability. And I can't say, if I, even if I knew the answer to that, that it would, that it would change anything for me personally um, about how I, how I do what I do, my actions. Uh, it's, just, it's just one of those ponderings. How long before was that decision made? Uh, it is popular today or it's not unpopular anyway. And I say today, but maybe it's been for a long time, maybe longer than I think it has. But it's popular today to say that the book, this word, uh, you hear stuff like, well, you know, it's, it's really hyperbole. It's, it's a lot of hyperbole. It's, it's, you know, it's exaggerated. And it's exaggerated, exaggerated stories. It's not really meant to be taken literally. Or you hear people say, well, it's, it's kind of like folklore. And, you know, folklore are those stories that are passed down from generation to generation around, you know, the fireside chats and the going through families are together and, and they tell the stories to their kids and their grandkids and the, the stories morph and they, you know what I mean? Well, it's just, it's just folklore. It's Christian culture or history uh, passed through generations by word of mouth. And because of that, it's subject to embellishment, maybe even some distortion over time. And then people will say, well, you know, it's, it's, it's allegory. It's allegory. It's meant to convey a message or a moral, but again, not necessarily to be taken completely literal. 
You know, all those things are popular today. When you talk to, if you talk to a wide range of people, you hear all kinds of different um, ideas about what, what God, what, what this book, this word really is. So, or how we're supposed to use it and maybe not use it. So it's not necessarily literal. Now, I know a lot of people, and we have one of them, we have one here. Not that he's not the only one. Jeffrey likes to talk about the archaeology. And even if there has been some archaeological discoveries, what that does mainly is it makes some of the characters of the Bible harder to deny, right? Because there's archaeological evidence that there was a King David, that there, you know, that there was a Herod the Great, and all these different things, and, and other different things that we could talk about that have been discovered archaeology, archaeologically. That's easy for me to say. But again, that, that's, that validates maybe some of the characters, but it doesn't validate all the stories surrounding those characters. So we can see how there might be some truth in that as far as the hyperbole or the folklore or the allegory and all that kind of stuff. But it doesn't take away, for most of us anyway, the validity and the strength of God's Word. But those things are popular. And even... Some confessing believers, because when I hear those things that, well, you know, it's really not this or it's not that, it's not always people who are trying to deny, I mean, because some of those people are believers or confessing believers and have, that have adopted this not quite so literal concept of, of the Bible's teachings. Now, I will say the verdict is still, the verdict is still out for me about any of that, how, how, how any of that would affect or does affect the faith aspect because we do believe it's God's word and especially if you're a confessing believer you know there are those things that we have in common so I don't know how any of those things affect the faith aspect again I said the verdict's still out and I'm not going to try to clear that up today but the word the word does tell us in Hebrews that the ancients were commended for having confidence in what they hoped for and assurance about what they could not see. And you know that scripture from Hebrews, or you know the King James Version um, of that concept, that they were commended for that assurance and the confidence they had and things they couldn't really see, things they hadn't seen, but things that they hoped for. Now, <clears throat> The rules that are supposed to govern us in this country and other countries too, I guess, but the rules that are supposed to govern us are based on the law given at Sinai, right? That's, uh, I don't know that many people could argue. I'm sure some people would try, but I'm not sure that could be argued. At least, at least the ones concerning our relationships to one another. Now, the ones, the first four, obviously much more debatable or much more debated, scrutinized, what have you. Um, it's hard to it's hard to sit through a Bible study like we had here last week. It's hard to it's hard to do that and not have the first three verses of Hebrews eleven scrolling across the back of your mind, right? Um, we we brainstorm and we speculate and we have these conversations about the unfolding of it. What is, a, what is, a, what is our best understanding of, of how things are going to happen before the return of Christ, during the return of Christ, after the return of Christ, the resurrections and so forth. And we, we, we talk about those things and they're good. You know, and, and we, we, we talk about the unfolding of it, but we don't really question the happening of it, right? Is that not the real beauty of this word? Is that we're having those discussions and maybe we, maybe we don't always see eye to eye on the unfolding of it, but we, don't, we certainly don't argue the happening of it. So that is, a, that is a hope within us. Whether we think we're going to be in the first resurrection or another resurrection, we are convinced that there is going to be a resurrection. And that's, a, that's, a beautiful, that's the real beauty of the word. It gives us that hope and that promise. So, in my mind, it is the real, the real beauty 
of the word that we are assured, assured of what we cannot see. I've never personally witnessed a resurrection. But I have very deep abiding hope in a resurrection. And not just for myself, but lots of people. Everybody, in fact. Assured of what we cannot see. This has to come. This has to come. That assurance, that, that feeling of not, well, nobody, nobody during that Bible study said, well, what if there isn't a resurrection? What do we do then? Well, if you're dead and there's no resurrection, let me tell you, you're not going to do much. But we have that blessed hope. And whether we're right or whether we're wrong about how it all unfolds, we're going to hopefully be there. And we go, oh, this is how <laughs> this, is how this was going to happen. This is the, the series of events or whatever. And you can't wait. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to die. So I don't want to say I'm ready, <laughs> I'm ready to go today. But if I do, I think I'm a lot more ready than I might, might have been in the past. But assured of what we cannot see and that, and that confidence that assurance that hope when I say this has to come because I'm I'm not sure it can be taught I don't think anybody that sat and talked about the unfolding of the resurrections thinking never thinking well what if there isn't a resurrection or at least never vocalizing I hope nobody had that I hope nobody had that thought but that assurance is something that your journey has taken you to whether you've always felt it, I've told you plenty of times before that I feel like I don't remember a time, even as a little kid. Now, maybe if you'd have talked to me as a five, six, seven, eight-year-old about the resurrection, I might have been kind of fuzzy on that. But I never remember a time of not believing that there was a God who created heaven and earth and whose son is very important in my, in my path, whether it was as a kid thinking going to heaven or whether it's as an adult thinking about God's kingdom being set up here on earth, whichever it is, but I don't remember a time. So I don't know that, that that's just something that has to come to you, and it's whether it's through the Spirit, whether it's through your, maybe you're born with some kind of connection that everybody doesn't have. I don't know exactly how all that happens, but I'm not sure it can be taught. In fact, I'm pretty sure that it cannot be taught. That's something that you have to arrive to. It's something that has to come to you and be given to you, and I think there's plenty of evidence in the Word about what God does in that process to help us get to that point. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. That's what I'm talking about. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. That's the part I can't ever remember not believing. So that what is seen, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And of course, again, that's the first three verses of Hebrews that I talked about. That's, that's actually the third verse. And that's the, new, the NIV version of Hebrews 11.3. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. He made it out of the unseen, right? So we believe that, and it's great. And we believe in a resurrection. We believe in that hope. This understanding, this understanding by nature, this understanding that it talks about that it talks about in Hebrews eleven three, this understanding by nature creates a a healthy fear, healthy fear. And to me, one of the another way of of um, talking about a healthy fear is respect, obviously. And we're told more than once that this is the beginning of knowledge, right? This respect. This, this fear, this healthy fear is the beginning of knowledge. Okay, all that said, that's where we are. We don't question that there's going to be a resurrection. We talk about how everything's going to unfold. We know that we have this understanding, however we got there, that the universe was formed at God's command. And then you receive a request for prayer. That's where you stand, in those shoes, having those assurances, having that faith, and then you get a request for prayer. And sometimes, brethren, I know that we get requests for prayer, and it's, it seems like something a little bit trivial to us. Well, yeah, I'll pray about that. My dog's got to go, you know, and I don't, I'm not, 
I don't want to offend anybody that loves dogs. I don't hate dogs, but you know what I mean. Sometimes we have things come up on our prayer list, and it's like, okay, but if this, this person's wanting me to pray about it, I'll do my best to, to ask God's blessing and, and whatever can be done in that situation to make this person feel better. But sometimes we get those heart-wrenching request for prayer when we know people are struggling and I sent one this week for my first cousin Ruth Ann Young and and this poor child I, I say child she's just a couple of months younger than me has been through the ringer and been at the door and it <clears throat> It makes you want to pray as earnestly as you can. And you want results. You want it to be different. You don't want to have to keep, not because you're too lazy to pray or because you don't like having a prayer life, but you don't want to have to keep praying for this same person for the same thing year after year. And sometimes you just want God to move. So, when we have these assurances, but then, and I'm speaking to myself, brother, and I'm always the first partaker. I can stand here and tell you that I don't remember a time that I don't, didn't know that there was a God in heaven or a God on the throne that controlled things and was was there and, and, and formed the universe, right? Then you get a request for prayer and you feel so insignificant. If I drew, if I had the board up here and I drew a scale, where would your faith meter be on that scale? When you get a prayer request for somebody you know is suffering and somebody that needs great, immediate intervention, does your faith soar? Well, all I've got to do is go in my private place and get on my knees and this situation is going to be taken care of. If you do, God bless you. And I want, and I try, but then I see what happens. And you think, I'm not, not something's I gotta do. You receive a prayer request. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm in that space, I can feel I can feel James breathing down my neck a little bit. Because he says in the prayer of faith will save the sick. And he doesn't mince words. James says. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. It's not done. That verse is not done. That verse in James 5.15, by the way. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. And, he says, if they have committed sins, they will be forgiven. You ever think about that when you get on your knees in prayer for somebody who's requested prayer? Do you ever think about how Jesus healed? And how many times you see in the word? And from that moment, they were made whole. What does that mean to you when you read those words? Somebody being made whole. Maybe in a better space they were when they drew their first breath as a newborn baby. Because I happen to believe Jesus Christ, God the Father, does not do things halfway. Oh, well, I'll make them feel a little bit better today, but they're probably going to feel worse tomorrow. That's not the God I worship. I don't think God does things that way. Neither did James. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. And if they have committed sins, they will be forgiven. Wow. Now, we know we don't forgive sins, right? We know that's God's work. That's Jesus Christ's saving grace that forgives sins. But he says, 
James does, or at least James believed. You pray the power of faith, the sick will be raised up and their sins will be forgiven. That's what God does. And I would love, brethren, to be able to sort all that out for you. James 5.15 and other places. Heck, I'd love to be able to sort it out for myself. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat a dead horse here a little bit because I've talked about it not recently, but not too long after. I know at the Feast of Tabernacles last year and for a little while after that because it was such a big deal for me. But last September was, uh, wasn't was good for me. Well, I'll take that back. Maybe last September was good for me, but I felt like there for a while that Green Day had my theme song, Wake Me Up When September Ends. Because I didn't think it was ever going to end. Well, actually I did. <laughs> a few times I thought it was maybe going to end. You know, there's a line in that that says, in that song, Wake Me Up When September Ends, there's a line that says, Summer has come and passed. The innocent can never last. And I know, I believe, as I stand here, that all things have not returned as they were. And uh, some of it, some of it may be psychological. I'm, I'm aware of that. But I still don't understand. I don't understand why I had the experience that I had when I know, well, I know people that had worse experiences. And of course, I'm talking about the, the pandemic, the COVID virus. That made me miss most of last September. Like I said, I still don't understand why I had the experience I had or, or why other people had worse experiences than me and why so many people, it seems, had a much less severe experience than I had. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I mean, it does matter, but it matters less <laughs> all the time, But except when I, I still think there's lingering effects, uh, and some of them positive, but some of them not so positive. It doesn't matter exactly why I had the experience I had. But it, um, it changed me. Now, and I, didn't, I didn't say fixed. I didn't say <laughs> it fixed me. But it um, changed my perspective. It changed my paradigm. And most especially regarding prayer and protection. You know, <clears throat> and I say that because... And that transition wasn't just during. That transition has been since. And, it's, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a fluid changing. And I can't, I wish I could stand here and say that it's made my prayers more effective. Uh, I'm have to wait and see about that because one of the things about a prayer life is it requires a lot of patience. Because God does say, wait. But you know, <clears throat> Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, that's not how they're known. And, it, and it's, and it, and it, even that, and you know, you know their trial. We're not going to bow down to your God. We're, we'll, we'll, whatever you say we have to do, then we'll do it, but we're not going to. It all falls into that, yea, though I walk through the dark valley, you know, I will not. And that's, that's kind of what they were saying. It, that's, a, that's a dark place. That's a, well, it's a hot, very, very hot and dark place that you're talking about. But, <laughs> yea, though we walk through this trial, whatever it is, because their, their motto, their, their frame of mind was God absolutely can. God absolutely can. And I believe, brethren, when we get on our knees in prayer for a prayer request that's been made, we absolutely believe that God can. I don't think there's a person in here that doesn't pray knowing that the God that they're praying to absolutely can. But they, they believed God can, 
But what did they say to the king? Whether or not he will is up to him. That's his choice. We absolutely know that he can. The choice is his whether or not he will. But I, we, will not walk in fear. You remember the scripture that I got on there for such a, well, not a long time, but for a little while, 2 Timothy 1, 7, it talks about not being given the spirit of fear. We're given the spirit of power, the spirit of love, and of a sound mind, and then some of the things that I feel like that means. James talks about power. In that fifth chapter, in the 15th verse, James talked about the power of the prayer of faith. You know, there's the Old Testament or the, the former covenant, the new covenant. And we, we use that as, a, as a, a plank in our platform that the old covenant is still relevant. There's still lots of stuff there to learn. There's lots of stuff there to glean. There's those beautiful stories. I don't care. You can call them allegory, hyperbole, folklore, whatever you want to do. But that's the Old Testament. It's as relevant as it's ever been. Yes, there had to be a new covenant because the people couldn't live up to it. And that's okay. There was a way made, right? What a beautiful way it has been made. I don't know, though, brethren. I don't... And when I say we, I don't mean that as a blanket statement because I know there's levels of faith and some people have way more faith than others and some people have way less or whatever. I just wonder. We don't believe necessarily that God still works like he did under the former covenant. I want to, I mean, how long has it been since you read the 17th chapter of 1 Kings? Because it is loaded. Now, for those people out there that say, well, it's not really, I mean, it's an exaggerated story. It's not meant to be taken literally. You know, it's allegory. Yeah, you can take the lesson from it, but it's not, didn't really happen. No flood, all this, yeah, it's nice little stories. You can learn from them. But let's just pretend for a minute that God's word is exactly what it is. 1 Kings 17 and Elijah the Tishbite. Now, we already know there's a story, don't we? Who was of the inhabitants of Gilead said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be new dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now, Elijah's not saying according to my word. He says, the Lord says. The Lord says. Unless I give the word, there's not going to be dew nor rain. Now, brethren, I don't know. If we really understand how many days we could go without, now we get some dry weather and it goes for weeks or, you know, without rain. But could you imagine how long it would take without dew or rain? Not long. We'd start suffering, wouldn't we? But he says, except according to my word. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, get you hence and turn thee eastward and hide yourself by the brook, and he's talking to Elijah here. He came to him, and he's telling Elijah what to do. Now, I don't know when's the last time you stood and listened to instructions from God telling you to do something, and you started packing or doing whatever you needed to do to go do what God had just told you to do. Especially to go live in the wilderness somewhere by this brook, and you're going to drink from that brook, and I've, I've already instructed the ravens. They're going to bring you food. Well, you'd be down at the clinic checking yourself in thinking I'm having these terrible I don't know what's I mean do we trust the birds to feed us well if God tells you personally you're going to drink out of this brook you're going to go hide yourself down there until I say otherwise and we're going to have some birds to bring you some food on a daily basis kind of like the man in the wilderness right okay all right here I go let me go down to the brook Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide yourself at the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that you shall drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went. <laughs> okay. So he went, and he did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook, that is before Jordan. And guess what? The ravens brought him bread. 
and flesh. So they weren't just carrying bread, were they? They were bringing meat. What kind of meat? I don't know. But if God sends ravens to bring me food, I feel like I'm okay to eat it. Thank you, Lord. The ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up. Uh-oh. Wait a minute, Lord. You told me to drink from this brook. That's just, it's dried up. There'd been no rain in the land because God said, unless I say. So Elijah go down here and drink out of this brook that's going to dry up. But the word, he didn't leave him, did he? The word of the Lord came unto him saying, Arise. The brook's dried up. Elijah, you can't stay here any longer. You got to go. I want you to go to Zarephath, and, and which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Now, we've already seen miracles. No dew, no rain. Drinking from the brook. Birds are bringing you bread and flesh in the morning and the afternoon. Brook dried up. Now I'm going to send you to do something else. I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain you. And God goes before us, doesn't he? He's already, got all this, he's already got this worked out. So he arose, as he did the first time, and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray you, a little water and a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray, bring me, I pray you, a morsel of bread in your hand, because God's told me he was going to let you provide for me. And she said, As the Lord thy God lives, I have not a cake, but all I have is a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks. And I'm going to go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat and die. Now, you think Elijah stood there and puffed and blowed and kicked rocks and thought, God, you brought me to a fine place now. Instead of believing the word of God, and we know how that goes. You remember the, and I don't remember the names. They're, they're Fail me right now because it just came through my mind about the person who went and wasn't supposed to dwell with this prophet. And the prophet said, oh, but God's talked to me and told me, mistake, do what God tells you first. If God told you to do something, he's probably not going to have a prophet to untell you. If he wants to change his plan, he'll come and tell you, right? So here's Elijah. <laughs> We're going to eat and die because that's all we've got. And Elijah said unto her, fear not. Go and do as you have said, but make me thereof a little cake first. Bring it unto me, and after that make the make for you and your son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. So she went and did, according to the saying of Elijah, and she and her house did eat many days. Situation changed, didn't it? How many miracles are we seeing in one chapter? 1 Kings 17. And the barrel of meal wasted not neither the cruise of oil fell according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. Now, this is why people look at things and say, oh, this can't happen. It's like when they read about Job. Uh, you know, it says Job went through this and that, and he lost his family and his home and his cattle and all this stuff. But, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a nice little story, but it's hyperbole. It's been exaggerated through the years and da-da-da-da-da. Okay, well, you take that and run with it. It came to pass after these things that the son was sick, and there was no breath in him, and she said to Elijah, What in the world? Man of God, are you coming to me to call my sin to remembrance and to, <clears throat> and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me your son. He took him out of her bosom and carried him up into the loft where he abode. And he laid upon his own bed, or he laid him upon his own bed and cried. There's some great expectations here. And I think sometimes that's where I'm, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe my expectations aren't high enough and it's not about what God can do. But he cried. And he said, Lord, my God. And he questions. 
right? He questions, have you also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched himself on the child three times and cried unto the Lord. And said, Lord, my Lord God, I pray, let this child's soul come unto him again. This isn't asking for God to help a surgery go okay, or it's not helping asking God to help somebody get over the death of a loved one. It's not asking, you know. He's asking for a resurrection. Now, Kyle helped us understand last week the, the, the word resurrection. It's not the resurrection. It's a resurrection, right? There's a difference. He said, let this child's soul come unto him again. And the Lord heard. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the, <clears throat> the, soul of the child came unto him again. And he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down into the chamber, into the house, and delivered him unto his grieving mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this, I know that you are a man, a person of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Hyperbole, folklore, allegory. <laughs> it is power to your soul. It is power to your soul. What if someone were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's unfaithfulness? We're asked that question in Scripture. What if someone is unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? What does Psalm 91 say? His faithfulness will be what? Your shield and rampart. God's faithfulness. If someone were unfaithful, will, will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true. Let God be true. And every human being a liar. As it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak. And that you may prevail when you judge. Romans 3, 3 and 4. I have asked recently, I have asked recently of God, God, what can cause you to move? When we pray repeatedly for some of the same people, same issues, God have mercy, what can make you move? Not that you, no, no, that's not, a, that's not a, a, a charge against him that you just don't move. What can I do as a human being, a believer? How can I beseech you? How can you be besought to move on this person's behalf or on this situation's behalf? Because that's what I want. Could I lay on top of a, of a child and say, and cry to God? And said, let this soul be revived. That's, that's big time stuff right there. And, and it's after Elijah had questioned, did you, have you really brought this on this woman? Nevertheless, he prayed for the child, didn't he? He cried out to the Lord. Wow. Raised up, forgiven. <laughs> You know, you can read Matthew chapter 9, chapter 15, Mark chapter 6, Luke chapter 8, John chapter 5, Acts chapter 4. It's where you can read those made whole statements. James alludes to it. A prayer of faith will save the sick. The Lord will raise them up. And if they have committed sins, they will be forgiven. How else can you be made whole except for the Lord raise you up from your sickness and forgive your sins? I mean, made whole. You know, brethren, I guess I haven't tidied this up and given you something to easily go out and apply today. Just encouragement. Just encouragement to keep looking and to keep reaching for the power that is available to you. You know, Zacharias, Zacharias, and this is New Covenant, New Testament. 
was told that his son would go in the spirit and power of Elijah. Right? We're talking about John the Baptist. He's going to go out in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. And we just read one chapter here. And we know a lot of other things that happened in Elijah's ministry and his life. <laughs> some, pretty, some pretty big stuff. Yeah. Your son will go out in the spirit and power of Elijah to make people or to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I guess that's how prepared am I for the Lord? I can ask him, what can I, how can I beseech you? How can I, I want you to move on this behalf so bad. But to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And that was for the first coming, right? That was before the first coming of Jesus Christ. He's, gonna, he's, the, he's the voice crying in the wilderness. He's the one that's going to pave the way. And he's the one that said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That was the first coming. The day is coming. I believe this. When God is going to move. I'm not saying God doesn't move. Barry's already said it. We've already heard it in here. We don't know. We don't know how many times God's moved on our behalf. I think God looks out for us when we don't even know we're in peril. I think God has prevented probably everybody in this room multiple times. Maybe you get held up in traffic somewhere. Maybe you had to go back in the house to get your keys. Maybe you, whatever. Something held you up. And even if you don't get held up, my testimony still stands. Barry had a similar experience yesterday. Close call. Mine was a, <laughs> a miracle. Years ago, car drove through us. I, that, that's all I know. So God can. <laughs> he can. And he will. Be assured. Be ready. Keep looking. Keep reaching. And believe always. Coach, you're up.